So we bring you Trailblazers courtside from the Toyota set that normally you catch Adam Bjornsson and Michael Holton on Blazer game nights. It's Brian Wheeler, Antonio Harvey, joined by one of the more talented singers that you're going to hear in the greater Portland area, as we discovered last night on the Blazers postgame show, head coach Terry Stotts. Now, did you sing um, in a choir or anything in your younger days? I did not. I played the trombone. The trombone. Yes. Mm. Another hidden yes. talent. Now that's not an easy instrument to play, nor is it an easy instrument to carry around. Did you have? Did your parents? Did you bug your parents? Did your mom's here tonight? Did you bug your parents well, to actually, buy one? Actually, my mom used to play the trombone as well. So oh, hand it down. Uh, yeah, oh. it go, runs in the family. How about now that? I always get them. The, it's the, the trumpet is the fingers, and then the trombone is the slide. Yes. Yeah. I could not imagine ever getting that thing in the right place to make the proper sound. I, 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 hey, I was first chair all island junior high on Guam. Wow. My goodness. Oh, yeah. Wow. Things now, when's the last time you played a trombone? When's the last time you picked one up? Decades. Decades. Yeah. But do you think you could pick one up today, like riding a bike? No, I know the positions, but I couldn't, uh, you know, I could blare it, but I wouldn't be able to play a song. <laughs> We're going to have to find a trombone at some point no. here and get, yeah, you, we'll, get you to play I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to play a trombone. <laughs> you said you would sing, though, at a karaoke night. A company karaoke night, yeah. Well, company karaoke. When yeah. are we having company karaoke night? Or maybe I didn't realize we had had one previously. We, 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 we need to schedule one. Yeah, right you away. weren't there that night. I don't no. know where you guys were. I, we, I was there. I, 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 I don't even know if I was invited. I, 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 do, did you know though that I sang at the Hollywood Bowl two years in a row? I did not. What'd you oh, say? Oh, here we go. Blessed Sacrament Children's Choir in Los Angeles. Christ the Lord is risen today on Easter Sunday. Excellent. I yeah. have heard this story eight hundred <laughs> times. Because when people critique my singing, I say yes. But have you sang at the Hollywood Bowl? And I'll tell. It came in handy one year. I wanted to see the Who in concert, and the concert was sold out. And so I said, I'm just going to try this. And I called up the marketing department at the Hollywood Bowl, and I said, now, if you've been a performer at the Hollywood Bowl before, would that entitle you to maybe purchase tickets for a sold-out show? And they said, well, have you been a performer? As a matter of fact, I have. And I told them the whole story, and she said, I guess that does qualify you as a performer. So I was able to buy tickets to a sold-out concert. So it, it came in handy years later. And it's still giving. The story is still giving. Yes, it is. <laughs> Whether people want to take yeah. it or not, I'm giving it. <laughs> I'm giving it. So yeah, I've heard uh, that one before. Yeah. yeah. You'll hear it again, I bet. I'm sure I will. <laughs> See, for the, for the first timers, so yes. I, I know because interviews happen to me in the crossfire. I just wish we could get everybody the story so that we could be done with no more first timers. And <laughs> uh, speaking of stories, a nice uh, win last night over the Spurs. Uh, but. Everybody wanted to talk afterwards, of course, about the disappointment of losing one of your key players, Robin Lopez. And we know a little bit more, unfortunately, today that at least the timeline it appears uh, six weeks before he's reevaluated. It sounds like. Yeah, it's disappointing for everybody. It, obviously, for our team and for Robin, and uh, he's everybody knows that he's an integral part of our success, and uh, he's going to be sorely missed. But part of that's part of the NBA, and and other teams have had injuries, and we'll uh, we'll just have to move forward without him. And it gives opportunity for some of the young guys to uh, to show what they can do. But uh, whether it's Joel or Thomas or Myers or Chris Kamen executing extra minutes or playing small with Durrell at four or Nick Batum at four, uh, I think we have a lot of options to do. And uh, we just got to, over the next you know week or two, we have to just get a feel. I think we kind of had it on cruise control. We were winning. You know, we won 14 out of 15 games. The substitution pattern, we kind of settled into a routine with that and uh, and we we're having success with it and we'll we'll find the groove again. You guys played all 82 games last year with with Rolo in the lineup but you had some experience having to substitute that big man. Can you rely on what you did last year to help you get through this process this year. I think so. I know so we I mean we have Chris Kamen and Chris I don't want to run up his minutes but he is uh, you know he's a proven center in this league. I think Joel Freeland and Thomas Robinson both compliment uh, LaMarcus when they're on the court with him. Uh, Durrell last year we had success with Durrell at the four when L.A. was out so I, I think we have a lot of things that we can do and it's just a matter of you know trying to do them at the right time and gaining confidence in those lineups. You told us on a post game show last night that you weren't sure that you would go with just one guy as a replacement as a starter anyway. Now you've had a little more time to reflect on it. Do you think it may be a game by game case by case basis. It could be uh, you know whoever we start tomorrow will uh, you will see how that goes but uh, I think I think what's important for me and the team is to kind of get a rhythm to the game and I know players like to know when they're going to go in the game and get a rhythm to it. I don't want to. 
I don't want to change the rotation too much for LaMarcus and the other starters. Uh, but I want to make sure that we try and get combinations out there that that makes sense. And so uh, you know I don't I don't necessarily have the answer right now but I'm you know very open to looking at different combinations and different rotations. Now speaking of uh, rotations CJ McCollum we're getting word that he will be probable for tomorrow night's game. How important is it you lose one piece you're able to get another piece back. Well you know they're different different <laughs> different pieces of the puzzle. <laughs> uh, you know it's um, getting CJ back is 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 going to be good for the team obviously he was playing at a very good level for us when he got hurt he was gaining more confidence in his offense uh, his three point shooting uh, was in rhythm I think he had definitely earned a place in the rotation uh, since that point Alan Crabb has definitely come on and he's played very well and I think we all know Will Barton is a capable player as well and he showed that last night so it's it's a good thing uh, but as I said from the very beginning this the starters going to have their minutes Steve and Chris are going to have their minutes and uh, you know with Robin I don't know how much Robin being out necessarily impacts the fact that CJ is coming back other than the fact that uh, maybe it gives us an opportunity to play a small lineup from time to time. Chris has been a starter in this league he said after practice today that he's told you he doesn't care if he starts or comes in off the bench when he's been coming in off the bench the group he's been out there with he's been almost expected to be uh, the primary scorer with that group if he's out there with the starters a little different role so does he have to maybe adjust his game a little bit depending on who he's out on the floor with. Yeah you know the truth is he's played with uh, Joel on the court and he's played with LaMarcus on the court so uh, he wasn't on the court with Robin that much to begin with so I think the adjustment for Chris isn't going to be that big of a deal. Um, you know I, I really don't want to get run his minutes up and I think as a starter you have a tendency to do that. I'd like to keep him uh, relatively fresh in the second half in case we want to finish the game uh, as I told the players uh, and the staff. You know I think the, the starting rotation obviously there's only one pl person to uh, fit in there but as far as starting the game as far as finishing the game as far as uh, who plays in the rotation who plays what uh, it's it's going to be a little fluid right now but I, I having the luxury of a guy like Chris who can start a game can finish a game uh, I think really gives us some stability with losing Robin. Uh, an interesting scenario added to the mix of course that he's about to welcome a new addition to his family. Now how does that enter into things. Is there a standard policy that you have in terms of uh, what a player is allowed to do or permitted to do if uh, if he's about to have a new addition to the family in terms of uh, mixing it, that in with basketball too. I think it's hard to have a standard policy <laughs> when I've never <laughs> never been in a position where a player was having a child. Never in all the no. time you've coached. No. Uh, so and times have changed as well. So. Uh, obviously we'll give flexibility to Chris and his family and uh, do what we can and but also realizing how important it is that he's with the team but um, you know it's his first child obviously I'd like for him to be with him and hopefully it'd be nice if uh, if they had the baby tonight that would be uh, that would be good that would be an uh, I told Chris tonight's the night I, I think tonight's the night it works out for everybody <laughs> yes, play tough. along you got to sometimes yeah. you got to coach the baby gotta, yeah it's yeah come on baby be a team player come on, come on work with come us on. here come be on be a team player <laughs> I like it I like it Pack, coach you had a practice today you're visiting with us tonight and in between you had one of the uh, fun events of the holiday season for the Blazers organization a visit to Dornbecker Children's Hospital the entire team coaching staff players. Oh your Santa hat was yeah. worn proudly it looks like very nice CEO and President Chris McGowan GM Neil O'Shea blazed the trail cat everybody on hand and it sounded like it was the perfect event in that it made you guys feel as good as the kids that you were visiting. It's um, it was a great event and I've been to uh, in my many stops in the NBA I've been to other children's hospitals I'm sure Antonio has as well and uh, you know it's it's one of those events where you know you're bringing joy to kids who are uh, struggling with uh, with various ailments and illnesses but it's um, I think we're doing our part but certainly it gives us an appreciation of uh, some of the struggles that people are having. You know I know you've been with other organizations and uh, we compare notes with uh, other broadcasters that we talk to throughout the league and it just seems to me that the commitment 
and uh, the continued involvement that the Blazers organization has in terms of community events, I don't see other organizations. Everybody does something, but I don't see other organizations that make seemingly the daily commitment that this organization does to the community that it's involved in. You know, when you look at um, at Make It Better, the whole the whole concept of Make It Better, and when I got here day one, uh, getting the Make It Better pin, and how important the Make It Better concept foundation uh, it is to the Trail the Trailblazers organization and the community as well. I think is uh, it really struck me initially when I got here. Now it's now I understand it. But uh, when I first got here, the first day I got the job and was introduced to. Uh, make it better. It it truly is a, a great program, and and the Trailblazers are part of the fabric of this community, and I think that's just part of it. I know you're excited to be the coach of this basketball team, but I know that the coaching fraternity, oh. even though you try to beat the guy that's coaching against you every night, you still have some empathy for the folks that try to do the same job you do, and so I, I'm, I'm guessing you feel it a little bit when somebody loses their job, especially if it seems like. The circumstances appear to be unfair. Michael Malone uh, had elevated the Kings uh, to some pretty good respectability the early part of the season when they had a healthy team and a full group. They were winning some games. Uh, they beat us in the first matchup in Sacramento. And DeMarcus Cousins goes down with uh, viral meningitis and uh, they lose their best player. Not surprisingly, they lose some games. And all of a sudden he gets dismissed as, as head coach of Sacramento. And then it uh, comes out that maybe there were some internal issues. Maybe he and GM Pete D'Alessandro didn't get uh, along. Maybe he and the ownership didn't get along. Whatever the case, it doesn't seem like it was a fair playing field for him. And, and while you may not be able to comment on everything about that because maybe we don't know all the circumstances, it did appear that that was a head coach that didn't necessarily have a fair shake at things. It, it's a shame. I mean, we all know that uh, there's there's a good chance that uh, uh, <laughs> you're not going to have a 20 year career with the same franchise. We understand that. Uh, but from the outside looking in, I, I know for a fact what a good job Michael Malone was doing with the with the Kings. Uh, he made them competitive last year. Obviously, they got out of the gates very well this year. They've played us well. They you know, I always look at a team if the players are playing hard for the coach or playing hard in general. I think that's a reflection of the coach and that everybody's on the same page and I saw that in Sacramento. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. No one does outside the organization and that's that's their business. Uh, but you always hate to see a coach lose his job when it appears that he is doing a good job with the team. It certainly from the outside looking in and that's all we, as you said we can talk about is the outside looking in. DeMarcus Cousins had bought in. He, the first time in his career he had bought into a coach. I don't know if Sacramento can necessarily recover from this because he is a what, mercurial personality at best talking about DeMarcus Cousins. You never know what you're going to get. What do you do with that now? How do you get him back into the fold? Well now the onus is on uh, and on ownership and management to uh, to hire a coach and get the ball rolling in the right direction and that's a challenge. Uh, I think the, the your observations on DeMarcus are are kind of ring true. He's he's been uh, he's had an up and down career but he certainly got out of the gates well. He was playing uh, at an all star level by all accounts and uh, you you want to in this league your best player has to be on board with what's going on and it seemed like DeMarcus was players evolve coaches evolve and uh, even though you're doing a terrific job with the Trailblazers you were a pretty good head coach a while ago but I don't know if you had the same resources the same commitment organizationally uh, in Atlanta in Milwaukee as you have here in Portland how difficult is it to be successful if you're a head coach if you don't have the support if you don't have the structure that that gives you that kind of support from from top to bottom which it appears maybe Mike Malone didn't have in Sacramento. The best franchises have uh, ownership management coaches everybody everybody understands what what's what's going on you know what the direction of the team uh, you know I have conversations with Neil I have conversations with Paul and Neil does with Paul so everybody knows uh, we talk about issues with the team and you know there are going to be disagreements but ultimately everybody wants the same thing is to win games but there's also kind of the dichotomy between management and developing players and personnel decisions and coaching trying to coaching trying to win right now with players that he thinks he can win with. I don't know if that's necessarily the case but 
look, there, everybody has a has a job to do. Everybody, and it's not always easy. And you know, I have, you know, you mentioned Atlanta and Milwaukee. I, I had great support with uh, with Billy Knight and Pete Babcock in Atlanta, and Larry Harris and Senator Cole, who I'm still very close with in Milwaukee. And so I really can't say that that was the case for me in those two situations. You just do the best job you can. I think the ownership and management make decisions in the best interest of the franchise. Uh, sometimes they're opposing. That's uh, that's life sometimes. All right, Coach, I, I want to ask about now the kind of the structure of the NBA and not just not the, the league as a whole, but but teams, because you've been around the league as long as I have. It certainly seemed like there was a time when teams were staggered. It was four or five young guys, four or five, five guys of middle age, and then it was three or four, maybe five even older guys. Now it just seems like teams are built around young guys, and if as a coach you can't figure out how to get these young guys to play like old guys, there's no patience for that. It's, it's amazing. It's really difficult to have uh, a team full of young guys because you – and sometimes it's difficult to have a veteran on a team with young guys because the veteran – still wants to play you know he's not ready to be a mentor he still wants to to get on the court and earn his salary and get another contract uh, and sometimes it's difficult to have old guys <laughs> you know sometimes it's just difficult it's just a different, different <laughs> it's word but you know I look honestly I look at um, I think an understanding and accepting of roles and and your place in the grand scheme of things within the team I, my two favorite examples were uh, when we went to the finals in Seattle, we had the starters were the starters. Sam Perkins and Nate McMillan came off the bench. We had Eric Snow and Sherelle Ford and Steve Scheffler who knew they weren't going to play, but they practiced every day. And then you had some guys in the middle ground like Vince Askew and, and David Wingate. But everybody kind of knew where they fit. And my the year in Milwaukee when we went to the conference finals, it was the same thing. We had our starters. We had the big three with – Glenn Robinson and Ray Allen and Sam Cassell and we had the next tier of players and then we had rookies like Joel Prisbilla and Michael Red and Jason Hart who knew they weren't going to play and so everybody kind of knew where they were on the pecking order and they accepted their roles and I don't know if that's why we won but it certainly helped. Coach thanks so much for the time uh, we'll let you entertain the two most important ladies in your life the rest of the evening uh, your mom and uh, and yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Yes, you want to make sure that uh, there was <laughs> no, no mystery there. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> no I was there. just listening. And uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. I know you do some prep work uh, before the night is done too. And uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow night for the Blazers and Bucks. Gentlemen, it's always a play. You know, I, it's almost a lot of people don't realize that we do our post-game radio show and it's not face to face. Right, right. I think it's easier for me personally to take shots at you <laughs> when I'm not looking at you. <laughs> There's a sympathy factor. Yeah, right. I here. can take my. I'm sitting in my. <laughs> office with my headphones it's much easier to face those people to yes. face the, you know to do the daggers <laughs> rather than we're sitting here face to I think face. we should FaceTime the post game show from now on yes I think that not, yeah, I feel safer that way although it's a lot more fun uh, when the coach is at his uh, sarcastic <laughs> best so hopefully he will be again tomorrow thank you sir all right thanks guys Pleasure's head coach Terry Stotts uh, didn't have to come by but that's the kind of guy that he is that's right it's like it's like